welcome Paul Hi. McGregor. Hi. Um, this is um, a short series of podcasts called Inspiring Derby. Um, the idea behind it was that I just wanted to get some inspirational stories out there to people who wouldn't necessarily have heard them if somebody wasn't putting them out there. Um, you and I have met um, in a professional capacity, which I'm sure we'll get to shortly. Um, but in the meantime, to begin with, I just wanted to chat about the beginning. So you were a professional footballer. So shall we start with a little bit of how you got into that? Did you always want to be a footballer? Um, it was the thing that came along first, really. I, um, you know, like most young kids, you know, the typical uh, cliche of, you know, you've, you've dad throwing a ball at you and you had no choice but I was born in Bootle uh, Liverpool my dad's a toffee in Evertonian and uh, I had no choice but to be a footballer really um, he big was footballing family not really he was a okay. decent he was uh, it was more my mum's side that were the footballers and the sporting side my mum's brother won the Lonsdale belt twice um, uh, Johnny Cook uh, the Cook brothers were a, a kind of a big boxing family in Liverpool so they were around sport a lot, and uh, you know Ian St John and the whole Liverpool that Liverpool side. Uh, my mum and dad would hang out with them quite a lot. So there was all that in the sixties. But um, in terms of me playing football with my dad and him bringing him bringing me on, it was the same as any kid really. I was just besotted with this thing. You know, I, I, some of my earliest mem memories are being thrown out of um, British home stores with my mum because I used to take this ball to town with me on the bus. And wherever I could, I'd sneak off and I'd dribble it around in the shop. And I used to take it to the shops, take it to school, take it everywhere. You know, it never left my side. Um, my, I'd put my boots next, I'd position my boots next to the bed so I'd fall asleep looking at them waking, you know. So it was a real passion then. It was something that it was, was an obsession. fairly inevitable. It was a, it was that a total a, obsession. As a youngster, you were going to go into some youth team, wherever it was that you Yeah, you I mean, I'd, and... in my mind, at that young age, there was, there was nothing else in the world to me. There was nothing else I was ever going to do. So that's going to come to fruition in some way, I think, um, when somebody's that obsessed with something, uh, for the good or the worse. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, you, you, you get into this team and that team. I remember my dad taking me to Clifton All Whites um, and started me off uh, a year below my, a year above myself. And I did started doing really well in that side and then dropped down to my own level. And then you start getting noticed and you, you, you run through those systems. Um, and then all at some point if you're scoring goals which is what my job was um, all the big clubs come knocking on your door and that was pretty much the start of the career I can remember signing my professional forms on the back of a Cortina at, <laughs> um, at Wilford Sports Complex okay because over in Nottingham yeah yeah, yeah. Forest were um, it was it, it was after a Forest uh, schoolboy game and Forest had found out that I was talking to Manchester United and Everton and um, Sheffield Wednesday and a few other clubs. Um, so, Even at that early age, that young age? Oh goodness, you have no idea, yeah. I mean, now it's years from the age of six, seven onwards, there's, there's scouting kids, but yeah, 11, 12, 13, they're trying to tie you down. That's that's a really early age, a formative age, to be confronted with, essentially your 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 dream opportunities. You know, big clubs like that must have been a real dream for somebody who was obsessed with with the sport. So it must have really been head turning. Yeah, but uh, there's a weird thing that you take it in your stride because it's what you've always known, and there's there's that naivety of youth, and there's such a beautiful. Um, purity of that dream is that yeah. that's what I'm going to do well this is the next step and I guess at that age you you aren't aware of distractions or anything else in the world and you know that that's that's all that exists in your world so it, it, like you say it, it well there were sense. girls they came along very at some good point. excellent yes um, and um, I started getting into music quite heavily around about that that sort of age um, going to um, when we went up to comp as we used to call it um, <laughs> Uh, the, the the lad in my class that I became really good friends with, his brother was the coolest kid around. So he was, um, you know, skateboarding, skinny jeans and winkle pickers and anoraks and bowl haircuts and got us all into the Velvet Underground and really early uh, indie bands like, original indie bands like The Married Chain, Poo Sticks and uh, When Primal Scream were really early and all that kind of stuff. And 
So, so it was that kind of sort of mid to late teens that you were all of a sudden aware of, of something else in your life other than football. No, this is this is early. This is this is thirteen. 12, 13, wow, and we started so music forming and bands football were in very school. Much the two passions for you, yeah, early, that, really early on. At that stage, yeah, I was in bands and, and playing music, and uh, f- football offered me a job very quickly. Um, so I knew straight from school when I signed at 14. It's a dreadful thing to do to a 14 year old to kind of give them a professional contract because you know you're leaving school to walk straight into becoming a professional footballer. You imagine the attitude of a 14-year-old kid at school with the GCSEs. <laughs> well, <clears throat> um, I, you, you cease to care, really. You can try your best. But I, I can remember that I look back fondly on those summer <laughs> days of revision. Because the consequences aren't there. Because it essentially just doesn't Wasn't matter. bothered. You've already got it planned out. I was, I was leaving to go and play football for Brian Clough. I didn't care. And why would you? Um, I regret that enormously now. Really? It, oh, massively. Yeah, not you know, your GCSEs don't particularly mean that much in the grand scheme of things. But um, it was one of the things when I retired from football at twenty-eight to go and be in a band. Um, I for three years, I, I I must have spent about ten grand within the first six months on books. And I went and I read and I read and I wrote and I learned how to write. I essentially learned how to read and not learn how to read. I could read, but you know, digest and study. Yeah, yeah, and, exactly. And, and get involved um, with the words, And yeah. I fell in love with that as well. Yeah. So that blew my mind, and I just thought, oh, I really, because I'm a massive science head as well now. So I really wish I'd have paid attention. So when, what, when what would your message be to anybody who is? fortunate enough I guess to have their career presented to them on a plate at such a formative young age is not necessarily shy away from that but maybe have a slightly different attitude towards the opportunities that have been presented. I I wouldn't presume to offer that kind of advice simply because a friend of mine used to play for Forest as well Jason Lee he goes into all the clubs talking about um, education um, and what the PFA can offer in terms of education. But what do you say to a 17 year old who's signed for Chelsea, who's come from an estate in Hackney, who's now got a Range Rover, who's on 30 grand a week, and he'll never make a first team appearance? No, no, no one can say change that, that, can they? Nothing no. I can say to him. Why would he listen to me? Okay, let's fast forward a little bit. We've touched a little bit already on the music side of things and, and, and how that was also a passion that was already embedded from quite a young age. Um, when did you <coughs> start in playing in bands? And um, When I was about... We had my first band when we were about 14 and we were called uh, Merck, named after the mud shop uh, in London. I think it's Carnaby Street. I might be wrong, um, but we were massively into the small faces and all that kind of stuff, and lots of sixties things, and um, a lot of northern soul. Um, and this this was precursoring um, uh, Britpop um, by a few years, um, so we were kind of heading that way anyway. Um, and then when I got to Forest, um, and everyone found out that I was in a band as well, okay. it got thrust into the limelight quite quickly because the Britpop thing happened and to have a footballer that's breaking into the first team at Forest um, who's got this silly haircut <laughs> um, you know that's, that's into all these bands it's into all these things that the, the whole of the UK is starting to really buzz, or, buzz about the media wanted that massively it um, brought it, it essentially I guess it brought two popular cultures together into, it, into it one. clashed them yeah and I was kind of the, the face of that um, you know the Brit pop football or whatever that means. But um, I read an interview actually yesterday, uh, just 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 sort of introducing myself to your, your the sides of you that weren't football. And um, I, I heard one of your I read that one of your managers had said I don't want any rock stars in my changing room. You omitted a couple of words. All words you? to that effect. That was Ron, that was the lovely Ron Atkinson. And and so it it 
that clash was was a positive thing from a media perspective and it allowed you to have both of your passions together but at times I guess they, they fought each other maybe it sounds like well everyone thought not everybody because sensible people like Frank Clark who was into music himself could play guitar so my boss at Forest during the time when it was really happening um, he was very considerate um, he knew for a fact you know he knew that I'd come from a good family. He knew um, that my parents would never let anything like that happen. Ridiculous happened to me. He'd met my friends on several occasions. My friends used to come watch the game. You know, we'd just all grown up together. We were not out doing hallucinogenics and living a Pink Floyd lifestyle. You know, I was training. I was barely having a drink. Um, and we were playing the odd show and we were rehearsing. So my downtime would be rehearsing with my mates in the band. The other lads, mind you, we're off out, Ritzes, wherever, Black Orchid, you know, every Thursday, every Wednesday, getting smashed, doing goodness knows what. Um, but I was the one that had this reputation of being whatever to the media, simply on the back of laddism. And if you're in a band and you're a lad and you, that's what you do. So it was, you know, I had to fight that with a lot of people, um, but not Frank Clark, but you know, someone like Ron Atkinson, who came in and we all know what kind of a man Ron Atkinson is don't we yeah. he came in and his first quote was you know and recently to be quite fair to him he he'd said in a in a, in a small little piece that um, you know I was one of the brightest young stars of the UK he put me alongside people like Robbie Fowler and all these great players and I thought Ron Atkinson's coming in I'm gonna get a good chance here and he walked onto the park and said let's see what we've got here because I don't want any beep 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 rock stars in my team you know, your life drains from you. Young lad, I've just come back from injury. I've had an injury that knocked me out for six, uh, six months. Um, you, you work hard, and by the way, they are some dark times, especially when the manager that loved you disappears, and then another manager comes in and goes, and then another manager, and then you know you go from being up there to not being recognised by the coaching staff in the corridor in six months. So they're tough. They're tough things when your career's done that and then it gets swiped out from under you. As a young lad, looking back now, I go, that's a lot to take for a kid. Um, was it your music that, that helped you? Or was it parental support or friend support? What helped you, or was it inner strength, get get over that and, and, and battle through those dark times? It's a combination of all three. I would say, I would say my parents at, at, at that time. Um, so what sort of age are we talking about? Were you there? Uh, Nineteen. See, it's such it's such a young 19, age. Nineteen twenty. Yeah. To have to be faced with that that level of disappointment and potentially self doubt and and lack of confidence because all of those things come just through the situation that you're in. Yeah, and if you and think about you know poor little footballer and all that, but if you think about the dog that you get when you breed a footballer, you tell a fourteen year old that he's going to be a footballer. All of a sudden, and you have to do this, their confidence starts going through the roof. You don't walk on a park not thinking you're the best player on that park. You have to you have to have these levels of confidence. Or you'd have no place on that pitch. You have to walk out there ten foot tall. And if you don't, like I say, you have no place on that park. So these things are confidence machines. They are just big and brash. And this is why we get footballers that we get. Um, you have to control that and learning to control that's an amazing thing that's where you get world-class players but you get this thing you build this thing up um, now when that gets swiped out from underneath your feet the rug gets pulled out and it crumbles um, what you're left with is just is this mess you know of ego and having to face reality for the first time. Not facing reality like everybody else at 14 doing their GCSEs and what do I need to take, I need to do this, I really want to do this in my life. None of that sensible stuff, just a reality of like, your money's getting halved in three months time if you're not fit. You might never walk again, you, you might, I got told oh, there's a good chance, I had a 70% chance of walking with a drop foot. That's career over and being um, disabled. So there's all these things that come into play. Um, so it's 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 a really difficult, and there's no support system no. at all, apart from parents, you know, girlfriends, mates, um, and yeah, you you come back into that life, and you 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 look to your 
you, I don't have to look to my parents. My parents are always there, always have been. I'm very lucky like that. But um, you know, girlfriend was great at the time, and friends were fantastic. Um, I have some very close friends that I've had since school that I'll always have. So I was really very lucky. Fantastic. Um, and so did the music. Did that? They did that sort of. Once you were, once you'd come back from your injury, and if we fast forward a few years, um, and you you left Forest and you went on a series of loan spells, did music follow you through that part of, of your career, or was it just about getting back on the horse, getting back into football, finding your feet, so to speak? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, like I say, the band that we got. That I got known for really early on. They were a school band, really, and we got okay. thrust into the national press. We weren't even close to being ready, you know. There were talks of Alan McGee coming to watch shows of ours and things. I was just thinking, I can remember thinking at the time, my goodness, this is the guy that signed the Jesus and Mary Chain, um, Oasis, so on and so forth, you know, My Bloody Valentine, and you know, all these phenomenal bands. He's not going to look twice at us. We're a bunch of kids that just happened. Can you play drums? Yeah, go on then. And I know some of the greatest bands have formed like that, but we were not one of the greatest bands. And maybe the media attention was was potentially due to the fact that you were a professional footballer oh, rather than the fact that you were a, an outstanding to do with the music. musician. Band. Yeah, nothing to do with that. And I learned that very early on. And I had a bit of fun with it to start off with. You know, going to things like the V Festival and there were billboards of like my face like 60 foot tall is this the coolest footballer in the UK and things like that you get out of a limo when you get taken to V Festival and you see that you know <laughs> it's going to put a spring in your step a little <laughs> but at the same time I was present enough not to I knew what it was you know and I knew my band was dreadful um, and I decided to do something about that um, to be quite honest to him our guitarist decided to do something about that uh, a guy called Andy Russell um, he left early doors and said, I, I don't want to do this. It's nothing to do with the music, which he was right. Um, Brave guy. Yeah, 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 cool lad. Always was. It was his brother who was the coolest kid in school. There you go. Run through the family. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I knew that. I knew that from then. And then when I left Forest, you know, it was time to get everything in order. And I went on loan at Carlisle. I had a lovely time there. I met some great, it was a really cracking bunch of lads at Carlisle. I scored a few goals. And then I went to Preston under David Moyes, um, and he was fantastic. He, after two months, pulled me in and said, "Look, I'm really sorry, but I've got you here as cover for this team because we've got a crack inside." He said, "But what I will do for you," he said, "You know, I only get quality and on cover." He said, "So I'll give you really great recommendations everywhere, and I'll take you on the training ground after training every day." So I had one to one with David Moyes for you know two months. It's not to be sniffed at, eh? Well, no, I just res I respect anybody that tells me the truth and is honest. Yeah. You know, a any kind of honesty. You can deal with honesty. One, one no hand. problem. Yeah. Positive you know or negative, stand. tell me the truth. It's fine. Yeah. Then I went to Plymouth. Showed Plymouth really chased me um, to go down there. And I thought, oh, I've been at Carlisle, now Plymouth. It's quite a trek. It's quite a trek. Um, but they really looked after me, Plymouth. And such a lovely club. Uh, great people you know it's the ends of the earth they know it they're not cool and they know it and they don't <laughs> care and it's like its own little country down there um, uh, just the loveliest warmest people and fantastic club really great club and I knew I got told you know you're a big coup for us We're, you know you're gonna be the first name on the team sheet every week um, and I went and scored loads of goals and player of the year and all that kind of stuff, fans player of the year, um, players player, all that kind of stuff. So confidence really building, oh, career was, very much back it on was track, amazing. Yeah. Um, left the comforts of, of Forest and, and really found your feet. I think yeah. with all the experiences that then followed yeah. to, to, to Plymouth, is, is um, it, it was you know it really worked for you, really. It did, yeah, and uh, I had a housemate at the time because um, my girlfriend moved back to London um, so I was single down there, um, and so I had a housemate at the time. Cause I had this, the pr house prices in Plymouth were ridiculous, so I had this nine-story split-level thing that I bought for 120 grand. Uh, it was a beautiful house, incredible. But um, so I was rattling around in this big house, uh, and I got I got chatting to this guy who ran a studio down there, and um, he was looking for someone to stay. So we became housemates, and then 
the band at the time would come down and we'd record for free and then they'd go back and we'd come down. We kind of built the foundations of what I then went on to do. Um, but then my career at Plymouth came to an end because I was a little bit homesick and Northampton Town offered me double my wages. So Plymouth offered me an extra five grand a year and more. Northampton Town doubled my wages, so and it was nearer home, so it was a no-brainer. But um, a dreadful club, Northampton Town. It was just uh, really soulless, and it was it had um, nothing against the fans or the people there or anything like that. It was just it was ran really poorly, and the players weren't getting paid, all that kind of stuff. It's not the greatest stadium in the world, there either, is there? It's it's an it's an absolute pit, six fields, and I've, and I've spoken to Northampton fan Northampton Town fans that have pulled me on this because I've I've had a go at the club on several occasions, but it's nothing to do with the people. It's uh, they should know that their club is ran dreadfully, or has been. Um, I know they're currently playing well, but they're still in a hole mm -hmm. from that period. Um, and that ground. Oh, it's where football goes to die, that ground. And it wow. certainly died in my heart. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know... So a sad, a sad, a sad ending after the, the high of your experiences on loan. Yeah, but the lads there were great. Um, I met some really good people there. Um, they were friends to this day. and So not all bad then? Not all bad, but as that was dying, you know, a couple of lads had, had left from the band... Um, and my brother had moved to London, who was then in the band, and he'd started hitting London hard and got on the scene down there. I was going down there quite a bit, um, and we started meeting the right people to make a proper band. And, and, and I guess at a time when you, you, you'd hone your craft as well, you'd spent time... We'd, yeah, we'd learned how to be in studios. We'd learn, um, We'd learn what what we didn't want, which was really important. Um, this was off the back of the Libertines, who we despised with a passion. Controversial, okay. Everything about them we hated. We hated the, the jingly rubbish, we hated the, the falling around on stage, we just hated. We wanted something cold and genuinely nasty. Um, we didn't want to embrace the crowd like they did. We wanted the opposite. By the way, I've come on to really like Pete Doherty and uh, played football against him a few times. And I, I prefer Baby Shambles to the Libertines myself, but I know the Libertines are a, are a good band now, in hindsight. But at the time, they were the thing we wanted to kick against because they were happening. So, but if anything, they, they helped you find your identity, <coughs> your voice, and, and who you wanted to be. and and what you wanted your music to be. So, so it was about that identity rather than, you know, personalities, like yeah. from what you've said. So we, um, I, I realized that the thing I've ha I hated about a lot of these bands were drums. Okay. Um, because um, drummers just hit stuff along with the music. It's very rare you get a drummer who plays the drums, in my opinion, who adds something rather than just keeping rhythm. Um, so we got a drum machine and we made it fast and we made it loud and we started going to techno clubs because techno to me sounded like how the Stooges would have sounded in the 60s it was powerful, it was visceral people were tops off and dancing and it was sweaty and it was you go to a gig and it'd be a load of indie kids drunk in the corner just bored to death with it it was just not interesting at all four lads with a guitar, done to death and so I just it, it was all about techno. So but it was about your music engagement with the audience rather than as the Libertines did, the people engaged, the artists engaging with it the It was audience. about putting up a barrier between fine, us. Fine. It was about playing music at people and taking their faces off rather than engaging in a communal hey guys, come on, let's sing a song. All together now, come on. It was <laughs> it it was the opposite of that. Um so we started but we always loved the sound of guitars, so we essentially just turned it into feedback. It was layers of feedback with hard techno and sort of holy Bible, holy Bible era manic sloganeering. That's what I. That's what we had. And we started playing on the London scene and all the warehouse parties and getting a really big name for ourselves. And you know, for a while, we were kind of the hottest band 
on the scene in the hottest city in the world um, coming through with bands like the Horrors and these new Puritans and all that sort of scene and we kicked London to death it was beautiful it was brilliant and we did it all in leather and we were noisy and nasty and brash and, and really what you wanted what that it was 14 year old wanted yeah, it to be everything I want out of a band we were um, and, and, and we meant every second Europe of it as well did it go to we did we got Europe. taken um, across Europe um, with a few bands um, the Sisters of Mercy uh, being one they've always been one of my favourite bands um, you know we ended up playing with goodness hundreds of bands uh, great some great bands Killing Joke um, you know loads of great post-punk bands really liked as Red Lorry Yellow Lorry all these really cool bands so yeah and then we made an album released an album but you know all this time we weren't earning so I'd had three years of spending my money I had um, a girlfriend who's now my wife I'm pleased to say who supported me during that time um, I mean incredible just incredible that she did that for me and we turned down major labels because the money wasn't there uh, we turned down a couple of American tours because the money quite wasn't there um, played Japan twice South Africa once released a couple of in my opinion great albums so how did, how did, how did you go from successful but retired footballer to European touring musician through to what we what we see as a as a businessman and a, and a and a fashion designer. Do you see a businessman now? and a fashion this designer? Is, I am neither. This is no absolutely. And I'm no, not even joking. I'm no, neither. But okay, so let's talk us through that. Where whatever we want to talk, however we want to describe where we are today. How did we go from touring Japan in a band, in a very successful band to where we are today? Well, it's funny you mentioned touring Japan because it was touring Japan that I decided to do this. Okay. So, last time we were in Japan, I found myself with um, <clears throat> my four best friends playing music that we love and feeling like a fraud because um, not long had a little girl and my wife's at home with my little girl and the band, we've been a, a big underground band we've never had any monetary success we, we'd got to the point where um, we could afford our studio in London which is no mean feat and our merchandise does good and record sales are alright but it wasn't bringing in any money it wasn't it was no lifestyle, job yeah. yeah it was a lifestyle so I found myself being miserable and wanting to be at home and doing something about putting money on the table now I'm not scared of saying that because I think it, it's a the drive, desperation really sharpens the blade, doesn't it? So the drive, Keep the drive to go and earn, as yeah. just you know, it, it really does make you get rid of all the fat and leave you with what what needs to go ahead. And the determination to make it happen as well. Absolutely, that, that focus and drive and determination to go. Okay, and and be that that single-minded fourteen-year-old again, and sort of only see. The, the, yeah. you know, it was fourteen, but it was football when you were fourteen. But now it's, it was it was putting food on the table and being yeah. a provider for yeah. the people around you, who and for the long term as well. And I didn't want to just go and get a job. Um, so it was a case of what I knew, and I, I've not covered the fact that I, I'd had money in a couple of small, uh, quite cool t-shirt brands that have done that sold throughout the world and um, hung around numerous people being on the London scene you know loads of kids in fashion and all that kind of stuff and up here in Nottingham as well we used to have a warehouse um, on on Carlton Road um, I say up here in Nottingham we're in Derby now aren't we, we I are, should yes. remember that yeah <laughs> um, but from from London it's all up here yeah, up here yeah. it's the same it's anything fun. outside the yeah. M25 yeah it's all good um so yeah, so and that was a company called Random that uh, sold. You know, it was a big mixture of just creatives um, that were making music, that were making T-shirts, that were making all kinds of stuff. So I'd finish at Forest and go up there and hang out. So again, another another splinter industry, really. So yeah, you, you know, it was, but it was quite natural, fashion. really. You know, we'd finish like tearing T-shirts, 
spraying them, bleaching them, and then we'd go over the other side of the room and there was all our kit set up in this beautiful big warehouse, like wooden floors and enormous windows. And, um, <clears throat> we'd have parties in there and the police would come and all that. It was a great <laughs> laugh. But, uh, so, yeah, th you know, from having done all that as well, I, um, I decided to do what I know. So, you know, that, and that came from kind of writing music as well, you know, only write about what you know. Um, that, that's what I've always tried to do. So I thought, well, I know fashion. I know, I know how it works. Um, I've always been fairly on it in terms of, you wouldn't think this, but in terms of <laughs> <laughs> trends, you know, I've always been quite predictive of that quite uh, instinctually, instinctively, sorry. Um, and football. And I, I, I'm of, of an age where I started getting invited back to grounds and you know guest of honor and all that kind of stuff and meet the crowd and all that kind of thing. And I just started noticing that what's in the club store wasn't it isn't what people were wearing. And I just thought, well, why not? You know, the club stores are full of merchandise. You know, bad quality, bad quality yeah. t-shirts, bad quality prints. The same print would be on a Forest T-shirt as is on a Man City T-shirt as is on a Rotherham T-shirt. So you start thinking, well, there's one company doing all this, surely. And just being lazy and just changing that. I thought I could do a much more reactive brand, go into clubs and care like a football fan and offer these clubs a high street product um, that fans would wear that don't feel a fall in. Um, but can still show their their loyalty and their dedication and their support for their for their club. Which Absolutely, is... yeah. I mean, the the tagline for the for with the gods is you know worship without sacrifice. So it's it's just not sacrificing style really, being able to kind of buy something in the club store that feels nice and you can walk into a bar. You can literally walk into a bar with afterwards and you know not feel daft or not get turned away for wearing it. Um, and yeah, this decided that that was something. So spoke to. It's a it's a pretty big goal. It's a pretty big aim. It's a pretty. Didn't seem it at the time. It seemed really natural, clear, and natural. And like, why isn't that that? There's something in that. So I spoke to Sean, uh, who, Sean Barker, um, as everybody in Derby will will know, um, ex Derby skipper, legend, I should say. There you to go. Say that. Now we're in Derby. Now we're in We've Derby. We've done enough Forest clubbing. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sean Sean is a Derby legend, to be fair, and. A lovely lad as everybody knows um, been friends of his for years and years he was in the same class as my brother at school okay so another link there yeah um, and I took it to Sean and said what do you think mate do you think this, there, there are legs in this um, and he said yeah uh, obviously Sean was still playing football had some dough he said I'll fund it at the beginning and um, we'll see where it goes so we started trialling it in Derby um, you worked quite closely with Derby County to get it off the ground we did and they were, they were ab they've been absolutely fantastic with us, Derby County. Um, they let us trial it, knock some things about, placing it in the shop. How do we put this in? We learned many things from it. That we have to have a collection has to be a collection in store has to look like a fashion brand has landed in the club store. Certain prints work, certain prints don't. Certain styles work, certain styles don't. Certain cuts of t-shirt work, certain cuts don't. Price range. Price range, yeah. So we knocked everything into shape. Yeah. And then Nigel went off to Sheffield United. So we thought, well, let's see if we can replicate figures uh, across up at Sheffield. Yeah. And they did. So it wasn't just Derby centric. It wasn't just Sean centric. It was. It was. A, it, it was, was the a product genuine, working. It, it, was, it was a business plan working as well. Yeah. I know you sort of argued with me a little bit earlier about I'm not a businessman, but it it takes a businessman to to spot an opportunity in a market to then create a solution to that, a product that that solves that problem, and it takes it takes a real entrepreneur to to bring those two things together and make a, a make a business out of it, make some money out of it. So from that sense, it's 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 very much worthy of you to, to call yourself a businessman, I'd have said, because then you've then gone into Sheffield and I'm sure you'll you'll rattle off some other clubs that you've you've then gone into. Um, because it's it's become massively successful for you guys, isn't it? Uh, it has very quickly, yeah. Um, I think the best thing we did was try it at some very small clubs like uh, Rotherham and um, uh, Chesterfield um, seeing what works and what doesn't because we, we, we thought if it works down there it's scalable upwards 
Um, things can only get better if, if, if it's selling in Rotherham and Chesterfield. Um, I won't go into it, but it didn't work so well at Rotherham, but it's done well at Chesterfield. Um, we know the reasons why it hasn't worked at Rotherham, and I've spoken about the Rotherham situation with every club I've then sat down with. So again, another learning curve in the Massive, route to success. Massive, yeah, and I think we're lucky that we've done this now because I'm of an age where you know I, I think I'm pretty good at seeing um, what does work and what doesn't and getting rid of that and keeping that and getting rid of that and keeping that um, and being able to listen to the right people to do that as well because you I, we should probably explain a little bit about the, the brand itself with the gods and what it is that it, it that you do so it's very collaborative um, essentially it's a it's a t-shirt brand for fans um, on the terraces initially it was aimed at the football fan market but um, I think you guys have got quite ambitious plans to, to take it cross sport um, but you're quite collaborative with um, the designers down in London as well so it's not just something that two footballers have got together and, and in Derby and, and decided to no well you know I said I wasn't a designer and, and my brother has designed t-shirts for ASOS All Saints top man you know he knows how to hit trends he knows how to place up a design um, he knows how to design t-shirts and he's had a t-shirt company with the basis now by Michael for a long time um, and a fashion brand so they know it inside and out so me and Sean can get in all the clubs we can commission the design um, and that was the very basic idea so it was all in place really we only had to look around so it, it, it fell in place it fell into place really naturally just simply from the fact of our life my life choices over the past 20 years have led me to this point where I look around now I'm sure a lot of people have are in that situation that don't have I'm not saying I have anything more than anybody else but I think at some stage if you can look around and go it has value and I think if you know how to take that and can and can look around at any given point and go well I can pull that in I can pull that in I know not to do that I know to do this you know you very quickly get rid of all the rubbish and you have this little nucleus of what you can actually go and do it takes a certain it takes a certain personality a certain uh, set of personality traits in order to inspire people to want to collaborate with you um, I know that you accredit it a lot to your 20 year experience, you met a lot of people and, and some people might say well it was just lucky that, that you, you knew a designer and you, you knew the music industry or you knew a footballer who could help you or you know the way into lots of football clubs but, but actually somebody can have all that experience but not be the sort of person who people want to collaborate with or, or want to do business with or want to be in a partnership with so if you're not that sort of person then you're not going to be able to do anything with those opportunities even if you do spot them is that sort of fair to uh, say yeah I guess so um, oh, I don't know what sort of person am I I, I, I don't know um, one that people want to collaborate with yeah I mean I, I'm I've always been open to collaboration um, you know but, but again it's it's everything's really close knit you know my close knit of friends are designers and footballers and all that and it's not you smile and I know I've just heard myself it sounds flash but it's just, that's just that's that's my life it has been musicians you know that that's who I've been around I, I've been drawn I've been I've, I've been a footballer myself I'm drawn I've been in a band I'm drawn to music I'm I'm in love with music I love musicians you know I I think that, you said that's it, just the world you that, said it that I'm in. I'm drawn to it, so I'm going to be around it, aren't I? Yeah, you said it earlier. It, it, do something that you you know about, whether it's yeah. writing music or designing T-shirts or playing football. Mm. If you know about it, if you're interested in it, then then yeah, why not make a living out of it? it makes sense. Um, so we touched on a little bit earlier that um, so we know what with the gods are now. Um, is it just football? Are you just hitting the terraces or no? We're we're trying to branch it out across as many sports as possible now so there are quite a few in the pipeline that I can't really talk about unless they because they might not happen but ones I can mention are Manchester Storm we've designed for those guys ice hockey um, Northampton Saints rugby um, we've done a really nice collaboration with Experience Nottingham um, so you know the tourist centre essentially um, because what we do really is just take a history, a heritage, and you know, 
make it Design cool, I guess. Design and accessible. And yeah. Um, so we've done that for experience. Not so we'd really like to do it for Derby, if they're listening. Yeah, let's do that. Let's have a shout out. Yeah, I'd, I'd, we'd love to do it for Derby as well. We're starting to branch that out um, as much as possible. Um, there's no reason why we should stick within within football. No reason at all. Fantastic. Um, and so that sort of brings us up to to current day. How about the future? What does the future hold for for Paul? We've done football. We've done musician. We've done businessman slash um, fashionista. What, what well, I've been hold? I've been a musician now longer than I was a footballer, so I will continue making music because it makes me extremely happy. Um, what are the what better reason is that to do something? Else? Exactly. What better reason? Um, and I love it. So um, I, I've got a lot of ambitions for with the gods. Um, the next couple of years are key for that, so I'm really, really driving that. Um, I've got my own kind of solo thing that I'm doing with a friend of mine called Tom Terrell, who's a, a pianist. And basically every Thursday night we've got a room in in Long Eaton, which is between Derby and... I'm loving it. And Nottingham, so... We're bringing the two together, yeah. aren't we? I'm loving it. Um, the, I, I just do on a Thursday night, and it's a double bass and a little noise machine and a piano, and... I just croon along and sing these little songs and I just absolutely love it and we're close to recording that. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it but I, I enjoy it and um, if I didn't have an outlet with music, the band are currently, we've got so much on uh, in personal lives, guitarist just got married, just bought a house, he's doing that up, life's got in the way a little bit, um, we're still writing, still doing stuff, we still speak to each other most days. Um, but yeah, if I if I don't do something creatively, musically every week, I'm not nice to be around. <laughs> um, so I, I I have to keep that in. But um, yeah, focus is on massively on uh, with the gods at the moment. Um, I can't see beyond that. I'm like you've heard early on. I'm very much the blinkers have gone on now, and I'm I'm nailing this down and um, trying as best as I can to make a success out of this. So if anybody's got any sort of sports club that, that they want to get a With The Gods brand on the go, then they can contact you. Visit the website, maybe. I guess maybe. so. I mean... Yeah, op open to, to suggestions. Is the chairman of Man United going to be listening to this? I'm he, not sure. He, you never know. You never know, you do you? You just never know. <laughs> the digital world is everywhere. It's infiltrating everything. Yeah. Although I'm going to say no, if I'm being honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Um, it's difficult, you know. You don't really, I can't really tap for business. I had, I had a meeting the other day with some with some young guys, and they were coming up with billboard ideas and all kind of stuff. It's not really that company, you know. It's it's very much within within football, and it, it's going to emanate from there. I think um, we're just trying to create as much as possible our own little world and draw people to it. Um, like we said earlier, very much like the bands have always loved, uh, create this little world, create this little thing that people want to come to, and if they come to it, great. Um, and that's the great, that's the the amazing thing about the modern world, isn't it? You can do that and just put it out, and whoever comes comes. You, okay. you soon that's learn kind of the principle I'm working on. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just putting it out there. Nobody wants it, but yeah. I'm just putting it out yeah, there. That's, keep that's throwing it out there. It. That's Facebook for you. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, Paul McGregor. Um, I think we're coming to the end now. Um, one final word or sentence or or bit from you. What what would you say to inspire others? From your, your don't listen to me. Your many years of experience. I'm not <laughs> going to put a number on that. But but, um, but yeah, what what would you say to to inspire anybody who might be listening? I'd say the one thing I've learned, if I'm going to speak to anybody, is don't be scared of anybody. Everybody is on the black. No one knows what they're doing. Honestly, from a young age, you sit in front of people that you think were important and big wigs, and you listen to them talk. You think, how have you got this job? And and that's not being conceited. It's not me going. Oh, I could do it better. You just so often I've been in, I've been really in awe of somebody or scared to go and sit down and meet with people, and you just think, what was I afraid of? Why? There's there's no reason to be afraid of anybody. And seriously, I've watched people work who have who are earning loads and loads of money and just been like, 
F- fear's in your own head, isn't it? It's something that it's it's we create, and therefore we we have the ability to break down if we want to. And 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 yeah, fear shouldn't hold us back. I mean, I, I'm I'm kind of blessed with that fearlessness. I've I've never been. I don't do it. I'm not scared of anything. You know, really not. Um, and I know a lot of people have that. And you know, how do I do this? How do I do that? And you know, get anxious about things. But that would be my little bit of advice. Don't sweat it. You know, just, just. <laughs> they don't know half as much as they're showing. Trust me. Um, so just crack on. Be confident. And get stuck in with it because. You've got as much chance as anybody else, really. Fantastic. Well, Paul McGregor, thank you for your time. My pleasure.